Good evening. And right before we dive in, I'll quickly mention that Epic Times is right now having a fat end of summer sale. You can subscribe now for only 50 cents a week for the whole year. So basically, instead of just sitting at home rubbing your two quarters together, you can give us those quarters, and in exchange, you will get unlimited access to everything over on the website. All the infographics, all the different videos, all the documentaries, the articles, everything. And best of all, they'll actually throw in two free gifts. And so if you've been on the fence about trying the Epic Times, well, now is a phenomenal opportunity. I'll throw the link down into the description box below. You can click on that link, check out the sale, and also check out what those two free gifts actually are. Again, that link will be down there in the description box below. Now, diving into today's actual story, in March of last year, something you can say unusual happened, something that had not been seen before. You had an American farm worker who worked with dairy cattle over in the state of Texas and that farm worker became infected with bird flu. He basically, he had to leave work after he developed painful, red, swollen, bloodshot eyes. It actually looked really frightening. Now, developing bird flu while working on a farm isn't exactly surprising. But what was unusual, though, was that this man claimed to not have worked with any birds, or any other animals at all, for that matter, other than dairy cows. The researchers looked into it, and eventually, they published this study right here in the New England Journal of Medicine, confirming that his case presented the first known instance of mammal-to-human transmission of bird flu. You see, it's been known for a very long time that bird flu is highly contagious among birds. That's why usually, if bird flu is detected, even one case, the entire flock gets killed off in quarantine. Farmers and health department don't really play around with it. As just one example of many, Earlier this year, you had the state of Georgia lock down their entire poultry industry, even though that's one of their top industries. They locked down the entire industry due to just several cases of bird flu getting detected. Now, bird flu, it is known to go from one species to another. It's known to go from birds to cats or birds to cows or birds to humans. However, it's never before been known to go from birds to cows and then from cows to humans. That has never been seen before until now. And this really does matter quite a lot, since bird flu is a very dangerous pathogen, both to animals, but also especially to humans. In fact, just earlier this year, you had a 65-year-old man in Louisiana die from a strain of bird flu that was spreading around the South at the time. Now, certain strains have very high mortality rates in humans. For instance, the H5N1 strain, its mortality rate is somewhere between 30 to 60%. Although I will mention just as a caveat, that those numbers might be a little bit overstated since that 30 to 60% range is based on hospitalized cases. And so it might be overstating the fatality rate because many people might have just gotten a mild case and never told anyone about it, and those aren't included in the figures. Regardless, though, it's not good. The saving grace, however, is that generally bird flu doesn't really spread from person to person. It usually spreads very easily from bird to bird, and then those infected birds infect people. But the big concern has always been mutation. If a strain of the bird flu virus gains the ability to spread easily from person to person while at the same time keeping its high fatality rate, well, that could actually cause a real major pandemic. But have no fear, because scientists are on it. Both in the U.S. as well as in Asia, researchers have been actively creating these synthetic mutations of the bird flu in order to create preemptive vaccines. Which leads us neatly along to this study right here, published roughly a month and a half ago. It's titled, quote, Experimental Infection and Viral Pathogenesis of a Human Isolate of H5N1 Highly Pathogenic Avian Influenza Strain in Jersey Cows. And essentially, what these researchers over at the University of Georgia did was that they took this H5N1 bird flu virus that the Texas man was infected with, and they used that virus as a blueprint to synthetically reverse engineer that particular strain using an artificial DNA template. They basically, in a lab, created an approximation of what they believed that man was infected with. They then took this new virus and exposed it to dairy cows to see how those cows would react. And according to the researchers, the outcomes included the following. Quote, all infected cows developed spontaneous and sporadic cough on days two and three post-infection and experienced decreased appetite. 
Notably, cow number three developed diarrhea on day one post-infection, which resolved quickly. Clinical signs resolved rapidly in the following days. We did not observe changes in respiratory or rumination rates, nor did we notice ocular or nasal discharge or dehydration in the infected cows. Then a few other findings, they included the fact that there was a drastic reduction in the amount of milk that was produced by these cows. The cows had a fever after they were inoculated. And then lastly, high levels of viral RNA were found in the milk samples. And to that last point, quote, consistent with the internal swab data, milk samples from all three cows exhibited high levels of viral RNA. Milk samples from non-infected quarters remain negative throughout the study for all cows, meaning the placebo group. Our data collectively indicate that there is substantial viral replication within milk samples obtained from Jersey cows infected with H5N1. Which obviously is not great, although it is worth highlighting that the researchers within the pages of the study they didn't indicate whether drinking that type of milk would spread the virus from cows to humans. Also, it's unclear whether the process of pasteurization would eliminate those type of viral fragments. Regardless, though, besides the milk, the researchers also noted that, quote, the mammary gland tissues exhibited necrotizing mastitis and ductitis. With necrotizing mastitis, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I've only read it before, but I looked it up, and it's a dangerous condition that can lead to sepsis. Although it's worth noting that in the study... They didn't say that it led to sepsis in any of the cows. And so those were the findings. All right, just to pause here for a super quick moment, I'd like to introduce our sponsor and my own personal gold dealer, American Hartford Gold. Now, as soon as the latest round of tariffs hit, almost immediately, the stock market hit some serious waves, we could say. It became super turbulent, very volatile. And of course, these conditions don't just affect Wall Street. They affect all of us with our investments and our retirement accounts. That's why I want to introduce a company that I trust and I use myself to help secure my own savings, American Hartford Gold. They specialize in helping Americans move their assets into something tangible, something you can actually hold, physical gold and physical silver. Two precious metals that help me sleep better at night knowing that I have a hedge against all those brilliant decisions being made over in Washington. Now, they have an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. They have thousands of five-star reviews and they make the whole buying process super simple. Your metals can be shipped directly to your doorstep, or you can transfer your current retirement account to a tax-advantaged gold IRA. And the best part is that right now, American Hartford Gold is offering an exclusive buy one, get one deal for my viewers. When you call them and mention my name, Roman, for every one ounce of gold that you purchase, you can get one ounce of free silver. And so take advantage of the special offer. Either call 866-242-2352 or simply text Roman to 65532. That's again, 866-242-2352 or text Roman to 65532. I'll also throw their information. It'll be down in the description box below. Although perhaps it's also worth mentioning that this research, it was funded in part by grants from the USDA as well as grants from the NIH, including one particular grant, Contract number 75N930021C00014. And the reason that I bring up that particular grant from the NIH is because besides funding this research over in Georgia, that very same grant was also used to partly fund another study that was based out of New York. Quote, the same NIH contract also funded a separate experiment in which Mount Sinai and Texas Biomedical Research Institute scientists engineered a never-before-seen H5N1-labeled construct that killed 100% of exposed mammals under laboratory conditions. Basically, these other scientists were conducting very similar research to the research that was being conducted over in Georgia. They were trying to reconstruct the bird flu strain that was found over in Texas, the one that jumped from the cow to the human. They did this using a technique called reverse genetics. Quote, The resulting sequence, which had not existed prior to the experiment, proved 100% lethal in mammals under laboratory conditions. The lab-built strain, labeled HPHTX-NLUC, was assembled using a technique called reverse genetics, which allows researchers to reconstruct so-called viruses from digital sequence data. When tested in mice, the construct triggered fatal outcomes in all unvaccinated animals within seven days. And to that end, specifically in their actual research paper, the scientists wrote the following, quote, all of them, meaning all the mice, succumb to infection by day six and seven after the challenge. Now, on the one hand, this is great. The scientists were able to reconstruct the virus 
and they were able to present their finding as an actual potential vaccine. It's almost like a miracle of science. In less than a year from the time it was detected in Texas, they were able to reconstruct the virus and test it in a laboratory setting. However, in practice, if you think about it, what they did was basically splice together different strains. They created a previously non-existent genetic sequence in a laboratory, and then they tested it on mammals, resulting in a 100% fatality rate. Now, maybe in some esoteric sense, it doesn't meet the textbook definition of -of gain-of-function research, but in a practical sense, I mean, you're altering viruses, and in that process, you're making those viruses more deadly. So isn't that gain-of-function research? all funded with U.S. taxpayer dollars. Now, I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm just saying that we should be honest about what this actually is. In fact, leave your thoughts in the comments regarding whether you believe that what you just heard qualifies as gain-of-function research or not. And if it does, is the potential vaccine that comes out of this research worth the risk? I mean, who knows what the actual truth is, but it is a fact that Congress, the White House, the Department of Energy the FBI, as well as the CIA, have all separately acknowledged that a lab-related incident involving potential gain-of-function research was the most likely origin of COVID. And so given that, should this type of research be continued? Although, to be honest, at least within the U.S., it's kind of a moot point, because back in May of this year, you have President Trump issue an executive order which effectively suspended all federal funding for gain-of-function research. And so moving forward, at least under the Trump administration, it won't be happening anymore within the U.S. But who knows what the next administration will do. Also, it's worth noting that America is not the only country engaged in this type of research. And so even if we stop, other countries won't have to. To that end, as one example of many, roughly two weeks ago, you had a different study that was published in Nature magazine. You can see it up on your screen. This study, conducted by Japanese researchers, just like their Georgian and New York counterparts, they engineered an entirely new strain of bird flu. They essentially combined the genetic material of two separate wild viruses to create a new one that they called VAC3, V-A-C-3, a new novel synthetic strain. Novel because, again, it did not exist in nature previously. It was artificially assembled, grown in eggs, concentrated, inactivated to become a vaccine. But again, The virus that they created did not exist in nature. It was entirely lab-made, which, if it's done for vaccine purposes and there are no leaks and no outbreaks, it's probably fine. It actually probably is good. It's beneficial. The problem, though, is always that one time out of a thousand where something goes wrong. And so, again, leave your thoughts in the comments on whether you support this type of research. Do you believe that the benefits outweigh the risks? And also, If you happen to be watching this episode and you're in this field yourself, well, then please leave your thoughts. Did I miss anything? Did I misrepresent anything? I mean, specifically, if you work in the vaccine medical research industry, I'm sure many people would appreciate your insight into this type of research. And so let me know if I missed anything. Let me know if I misconstrued anything, if I left something out, if there's something that I'm missing, uh, if there's just a blind spot here, because I'm, I'm sure many people are skeptical of this type of research after covid but maybe there's something that we all don't know about. So again, leave your thoughts in the comments. I'll be reading them tonight as well as into the week after this video publishes. Also, if you'd like to read the entirety of the papers that came out of Georgia, New York, or Japan, I'll throw all those links down into the description box below, which I should mention is that same description box with the link to the end of summer sale for the Epic Times. Again, it's just 50 cents a week uh, for the whole year. You can check that link out as well. And then, lastly, if you haven't already, smash those like and subscribe buttons so this video can reach ever more people via the YouTube algorithm. And until next time, I'm your host, Roman from the Epic Times. Stay informed, and most importantly, stay free.